and thanks for your time, everyone. Thanks, Fraser. Thanks, Stuart, uh, for running through all that. Absolutely great. Right, everyone, the, the, the highlight of the day, we've got the formalities out the way uh, and we're going on to the, the speaker event, All Star Cast. Uh, absolutely delighted to have David Monkhouse from Leisure uh, on board. He's going to be our guest host today. Uh, and the lineup of speakers, we've got David Stalker from, uh, you know, Europe Active as well as My Zone. Richard Henry, who is a freelance fitness consultant now, but obviously vastly experienced and, you know, previously worked with Midtown Athletic. And we've also got Ruth Lynch from Life Leisure. So, yeah, really looking forward to, to listening to everyone. And thanks also to SLNG Strategic Partners and Business Partners, our sponsors that have joined today too. So without further ado, and yeah, enough of my dulcet tones as well, I'm going to hand over to David Monkhouse. David, are you there? I am. If you can hear me, give me a quick nod. You can. Thank you very much. It's always the fear when you do something online, isn't it? Uh, turning up and nothing happening or getting my daughter's name at the bottom of the screen instead of mine. Um, I have to say a huge thank you to Dawn Ann and to Johnny and to the committee of the uh, Scottish Legend Networking Group for, for inviting not only myself, but the other three speakers along to share some insights with you. As Dawn had said, I manage a business called LeisureNet. We also run an event called ActiveNet, which we hope we'll see you all at in September, but I'm sure Dawn Ann will share some of that information before the end of it. Um, but um, you're not here to listen to me. You're here to listen to, as Dawn Ann said, a, a star lineup of speakers. And our first speaker um, is David Stalker. Um, and as you, most of you will know, David, he has a fantastic reputation, a brilliant background. And David is going to basically answer a few questions that I've got for him around his role uh, as president of Europe Active. So David, are you are you there? Can I see you? Yeah, I am here. I'm also hugely impressed with how you managed to sort out the background, David. That's, uh, I failed. And for that, <laughs> I, uh, I, I apologise to, uh, to, to the hosts. I've also got my WhatsApp going to the left with Dave Wright going, I can't get in, I can't get in, send me the link, please, because he's not impatient at all as an Australian, but he'll have to he'll have to miss out. But yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Absolutely. Brilliant, David. And and just for, for, for Mr. Wright, I actually didn't I wasn't able to reverse the Scottish Legend Network group in the background. So it's actually mirror image, and that's for our Australian guests. So um David, you you are You've done some fantastic roles. You really have been at the forefront of, of change within our sector. And one of the big pieces that you're driving currently as president of, of Europe Active is your manifesto. And the manifesto has four very, very clear pillars within it. And those are the things I want to talk about. So the, the four pillars are health, digital, community and standards. So let's see if we can get through all of those in the time we've got. So where is the challenge around health? What's your belief about what we should be doing? to really understand health and the health needs of our communities. Yeah, okay, well, I, as I see it, it's a Europe Active Manifesto, it could be anyone's manifesto, it's the manifesto for our industry, in my opinion, at least those four key words going forward. Um, and so let's deal with health. Um, health for me uh, needs to, rec you know, recognizing our sector's historical road and sport, leisure and recreation, but I believe that it's kind of our responsibility in the coming years uh, to be provided a physical activity which also supports social, mental health and well-being. And we have this one enormous opportunity on the back of a really difficult time following the pandemic to uh, to get stuck in and make a difference. And of course, there are other lifestyle diseases long beyond the pandemic, which we've known about forever. And we are at the centre of attention. So even from a European Parliament point of view, where sport is still very much what they talk about, they are now talking about what is the link going to be between physical activity and sport in terms of dealing with non-communicable diseases. Uh, now, I know that we've left Europe, but the same will be spoken at, at the Scottish Parliament and at the UK Parliament and the rest of it. So I only say this because I'm um, Europe Active President. And then you've got the World Health Organization, um, who are clearly saying, that COVID will negatively impact childhood obesity levels, and we need to implement science and database policies around health and, and, and activity. And further to that, they're saying there's going to be a mental health crisis post-COVID. And once again, they want to know what the physical activity solutions are 
that are, that are going to be uh, crucial. So I guess we need to build strong partner partnerships um, with with the with healthcare, uh, academia, and sport. We've done some of that, but it really is important that we we go forward knowing that they're not going to throw themselves at our at our feet. You know, the pharmaceutical industry isn't going to go welcome leisure. Um, you know, there is a three hundred million dollar lobbying arm of the pharmaceutical industry that's going to be cracking on with take tablets. So um, we need to be hugely professional uh, in how we how we approach this in order to, um, to to have the effect. And we need we need to be it's important that we increase our f uh, focus on that sort of disease uh, prevention, uh, get stuck into these uh, governments, but particularly at a local level um, and become professional health health delivery partners. If we go back and a lot of these people already have um, maybe the VAT advantage, whatever we call it, that comes out of out of being a trust. But if we want the VAT advantage to to go across the industry as a whole, we need to be recognised as health delivery partners. Um, and uh, and th this is this is our our uh, one opportunity um, to do it. Well, we've always had the opportunity. Um, the danger, of course is it's business as usual times are tough it's really difficult to um it's really difficult just to get things going staff cuts and all the rest of it and that flies in the face of um trying to be professional and building new partnerships with those health stakeholders gps medical specialists mm. but really um if i could take the guys on and this this is a really great active network you know i i really think health is at the core of everything that, that we should be doing as as leisure as leisure operators going forward. No, absolutely, David. And I think there's, there's been a few things that have really changed operationally. We've got much stronger relationships, certainly in England, as we're, we're offering our sites as vaccination centres and test centres. And, and those relationships, that evidence that we can deliver a great service has been powerful in there. And of course, the brilliant work in Scotland with uh, Public Health Scotland and SIMSPA to, to, to build the qualifications to allow our workforce to deliver, deliver with faith and trust. I think that will really support that strategic piece. And of course, going forward, it's going to be a blended approach. So how does the digital pillar of your strategy build on this health piece? Yeah. Uh, just let's make it clear that digital isn't linked in there because I happen to be chief executive of my <laughs> zone, uh, Amir. Uh, I think we all know that digital was coming down the line pretty quick, well ahead of uh, well ahead of this um, this uh, this pandemic. Um, but what this has shown us is that our entire sector ecosystem um, shows that digital and fitness tech is crucially important. Um, in order to reach out to consumers of all backgrounds. Whether we like it or not, we haven't reached out to all those consumers and it's a digital tech world, so we need to. So we, we have to hasten that sort of process um, and improve our service to our consumers, expand our market, therefore beyond the sort of current perceived physical and social boundaries. So, so digital will lie at the, the, the cure of that. And European Parliament are already saying um, you know, new technologies will play a crucial part in the de development of activity and sport going forward. They, they have laid it down and we need to make sure we are of those standards. So we've got to encourage the study of technical and other matters to promote the improvement in standards. We, we need to do it to increase our reach, as I mentioned, and most of all, to improve our business intelligence. Going back to what we um, talked about with health, but if we don't have our business intelligence, if we're not gathering those consumer insights, if we're not looking at ba better data collection and analysis, then we're not going to get the funding or the recognition or the health health partners. And obviously, um, if we're going to expand and be going to this much greater market, those people who can't even get out of their chairs and need to get out of those chairs, those big hybrid offers, offerings that we're starting to try to do, then we have to partner um, with digital, and there's plenty there. We have been pretty poor um, in the past. It's developed. It's developed a, a long way, but I mean, we all know that we've had uh, laughs on membership systems in the past, and things not working, and 
and, and comment accordingly. So we just got to be professional in this. So I think for me, digital and my zone being a part of that, but not not alone, they are um, they are just the 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 glue, the link that brings out makes makes the market so much more enormous uh, than than what we looked at uh, previously, and and adds to the the link with health. Mm. No, absolutely, because there there are people that will continue to interact with us, but will never cross our threshold. But they can still be part of our community. Um, and most people know I'm a big advocate of my zone. That's what kept me going in lockdown. All of the the little comments that we were getting, the the likes from your activity, and the nudges to say, "Have you done something?" or "Why haven't you done something?" which is is really powerful. So, that word community is part of your your pillars for the for the. Uh, a manifesto that you've put forward and uh, what what is the community for Europe Active how wide is it how big is it yeah the, the the community for Europe Active is enormous but the community you know the community is really uh what we as or you guys or as operators are looking at and it really is that whole ecosystem it is where our ultimate strength lies it's our ultimate strength as an industry I've pop back to the pharmaceutical bit. They are looking at it from such a high level of disease prevention and the rest of it. It's very hard to compete against $300 million in terms of exposure. You are in your communities. You are embedded within those communities and we must build the confidence and trust of those communities. I mean, in the, I think the 17 uh, UN goals, uh, sustainable, sustainable development goals, which are all about community. So we we should be leading on that. And that's right down to um, environmental protection, CO2 reductions, inclusive approach to things. Um, so it's if 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 we want to, to to drive a healthier a healthier in this term Scotland, and we want to and and the net result that has on uh, on saving saving on taxpayers and pockets and healthcare and all the rest of it, it lies absolutely within the community and, and will be quantifiably uh, so. Um, and we need to be able to show that our traditional structures reach mu reach much further than than just the boundaries uh, of the buildings um so i as i said social inclusion community outreach green transition sustainability uh, you can go on go on on and on um we have to change the image of our sector so we become more more inclusive to grow the pie talk differently different imagery and and therefore expand the network so it's everybody within the ecosystem of those sites. Mm, absolutely. And the fourth pillar is about standards, which I guess are the foundation for everything you've talked about. So are you creating digital standards to go with things like the CEN 17229, the, the fitness operation standards? Yeah, well, the, uh, you've, uh, I would have said CEN and only you, David, would know the number. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, there will be new uh, European standards um, uh, coming out and uh, that, okay. And, the will, and they will fit in with the UK standards. Simspa works uh, tirelessly uh, 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 driving standards forward. But standards aren't just there in order for you to have another cost of something that you need to do in, in, order, in order to hit them. Standards grow the, um, the, res the respect. Uh, it's standards which create attractive job and occupation opportunities for people. Uh, it's standards that gain the trust um, with the medical professional and healthcare providers. Um, the, the, this is why these are cru crucial. Digitalization, the standards that show that what we're doing and how we protect our information are, are up there. Um, and ultimately, it uh, attracts new, new, uh, new talent. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then that feeds, I mean, uh, Simspa, has been well ahead of the curve, well ahead of certainly the European curve in terms of creating that those sort of pathways, that sort of cradle to grave life within uh, within this industry. Um, but all these guys, all these sort of pillars um, link for me because you know if we're going to health, if we're going to be healthcare providers, we've got to have people who understand that sector. In order to understand that sector, we have to train them. 
that is about standards. If we're going to go out into the consumers and talk properly to people and they're going to, uh, you know, we're going to understand the thing. It's no, it, you know, we, there will be a place for the guy, the muscle bound guy. There will be the place for the person who can swim 100 meters in I no idea what. But we need people who understand people. If we're going to get involved in mental health, we need this. These are all standards that we have to we have to drive forward in order to be the professional industry. We know we are, but to be reflected as that professional industry. Mm. And, I, and I think that that's a really important piece around standards that we can all adopt um, and use those standards to drive our business to be better. Because if we're better, we'll have more trust. And if we've got more trust, it will be much easier for us to open doors, to encourage new participants and do things in a different way. You've said a number of times it's not going to be easy, David. What's the what's the early indication from European partners around recovery rates uh, of activity within uh, fitness and health? You know, I, I often, I, I, I'm going to uh, be controversial, um, uh, unusually. Um, the, uh, you know, it's a bit like the reporting of COVID. Um, the, the, you know, uh, you know, is did they die with it or of it or have they got it or does it exist at all? Um, you know, and you have different interpretations of that from, you know, didn't exist in Tanzania, but the president died of it. Um, and unfortunately, I'm not at a point. Operators are just opening up and they're having their, we're ahead of Europe for, for all the reason all, all, all the reasons we know. Um, what there is, is a lot of enthusiasm. There is a lot of enthusiasm and uh, and those who who liked their health and fitness are definitely coming back. But there is definitely a view and particularly and it is weighed on the male and female that, that the female market is not coming back as quickly as uh, the male market. Now, maybe that will be triggered off when classes start. And I'm not generalizing or being sexist. I'm just that's just uh, the, the way that 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 may may well go. Um, but if you look further afield, um, you know, the Australian market, they think they're they're rushing back, but they were only closed for about a minute. Um, so I'm not I'm not entirely sure they've had that whole impact of picking up the habits of exercising at home, going running, going cycling uh, and all the rest of it. So um, the data is, is being collected and, and things are opening up, but it will be driven. It will be driven by um, by organizations like this. It, it will be driven by the outreach of the, the members of these organizations and their ability to show that the environment that they're operating in is the environment people want uh, want to come back to. So uh, I, I, I'm I'm pretty positive about it, but I I think it's going to be an awful lot of hard work. Um, uh, and as you said, Dave, I've said that about five times, and I keep saying it, but I'm saying it to a set of people who I don't believe shirk hard work. I mean, when I look at this group, I think it needs to continue to provide a platform for the what you do, exchange knowledge, information, standards, innovation, digitalization, all the things we talk about, discuss, represent, you know, seek a common purpose. Um, if people are going to come into uh, public facilities, private facilities, whether those are standalone boxes or, or whatever, it is all going to be driven. It's going to be driven by organized um, largely by network organizations of which this is just a fantastic example it's going to be delivered by this uk active europe active and 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 they go on and on and on so never has it been more of a responsibility for networks to 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 work together to to, to drive people in absolutely absolutely david thank you and i think that's a really interesting link so that data is the data coming out of the moving communities, which measures performance in England at the moment, before lockdown, it was a 54-46% split, female at 54-46% for male. And it's almost exactly reversed that we're currently seeing without group exercise. So you may well be right. But it's really interesting that you link to data. And Ruth, I'm, I'm setting you up now. So time to put your camera on and uh, get your microphone on. Because Ruth, I know, is going to talk to us about lessons learned from reopening. And I know within that. She just wants to talk about data as well. So Ruth, are you ready to go with your presentation? I'm here, if you can hear me. I can. Dawn Ann frightened me for a moment then and emailed me and said, are you getting sent me the link again? So I thought about that, but I'm here, so that's, that's all good. Excellent, um, Ruth. 
Thank you for having me this afternoon. Um, as you'll probably be able to tell already, I've got a quite a strong Lancashire accent and I have a tendency to, to talk quite fast. So I'm going to be mindful of that for the next 10, 15 minutes so you can hear what I'm saying. Um, so, yes, following on from Dave, uh, I always uh, agree with many points Dave Stalker makes and uh, you, will, you will hear me allude to a few of them in, in what I've got to say now. Um, so I'm not going to sit here and, and tell you how hard it's been and challenging it's been and how many members we've lost. Um, I'm going to really try. I'm, I'm a person who who is lives life as the glass is half full rather than half empty. So I'm going to focus on the positive things that I feel that we've learned and how we're using them to grow and develop and be better in the recovery plan going forward. Um, so as we all know, you know, the governing bodies have been fighting quite hard to um for, for leisure to be classified as, as essential. And I think that's created a lot of recognition for our industry, which is fantastic. Um, but I do think it's now time to stand united and shoulder to shoulder in, in fighting forward to, to really, for our industry to be recognised for the impact we have on health. Um, it's time to think outside the box and think outside of our facilities as well, outside the four walls, so we can add more value and inspire um, more people to get active. Um, I very much agree with Dave um, on the health side. I think we need to look at um, this rather than looking at it as fitness, as, as instead looking at it as health. Um, and we need to create uh, closer connections and relationships with the health service going forward, definitely. Um, a few things I can bring up and related to the current times we're in. Obviously, we've, we've got this long COVID, um, which is still an area that's that's a little bit unknown um, and we're not really sure of the imp implication on people's health and it's, some of it's undiagnosed but it's definitely an area that's been looked into and I think it's really important for us in the industry to you know increase our expertise and knowledge in this area I think it's vital for us to help in that plan going forward so I think that's something that we really need to keep focus on. Um, the other other one is is obviously the mental and physical deterioration, um, which we're hearing about all the time. We've got an obesity crisis. We've got a mental health crisis on our hands. Um, I think they've always been there, but I think they're highlighted more so because of, of the situation we've all been in in the past 12 months. Um, so, and also the other side of it as well, of, of all the appointments of people's illnesses, you know, cancer patients, et cetera, who've had treatments um, and appointments cancelled. And, and frighteningly, I, I read something today that it's going to take three to five years to catch up on appointments that have, have been cancelled. Now, I know we can't cure cancer, we're not that good, um, but I do believe that that we can offer programmes and I know that um, Life Leisure are part of GM Active, which is a, a group of leisure trusts who come together to kind of make a bigger impact in the industry and, and we've come up with a programme of prehab for cancer and already there's been over 2,000 people we've reached out to um, who've been part of this program and and even though we won't cure it we, we are going to make people stronger and more robust to face the treatments that that they go ahead and impact like that we're contributing um so i think that's a, a big thing to focus on so i think it's now time to run with it um and you know so we can make the importance and the effectiveness of our sector so well known and improve the health and well-being of everyone so that, that's a good touch on the health. Uh, moving on to data, which is how you introduced me there, David. Um, yeah, one really good thing that's come out of COVID that, that, that we feel is we have now got um, really good organic data of our, our members and what they're doing. So prior to this, we, we get swipes in the club, but we didn't know. So some of our, our leisure facilities, they'll have a pool and they'll have a health suite, they'll have a gym, group X studio, we'll have uh, football pitches, tennis courts, and sometimes with each swipe of member that's coming in, unless they've booked a class, et cetera, we don't know what they're doing in our facilities. Um, because of COVID and because everything is under restrictions and our numbers and our capacities within all the areas, we are now know exactly what our members do. So they'll come in and we'll know if they spend an hour in the gym, half an hour in the health suite. So we need to now really collect that data. I think we've always been had access to data but me, hand on heart, and I think I speak to a lot, lot of us in the industry and many other industries, we, we don't use the data enough 
um, to move forward and become better in, in, in our service. So I think now we really need to, when I'm talking about data, I feel like I sound like Boris Johnson, <laughs> data-driven decisions, but I think it's really key important now that we use this to improve our customer service and predict trends you know, in sales and the products and services and optimise our opening times and our offerings. Um, so there's so much we can do to, to you know, we can predict things a little bit more with obviously the data that we've got. Uh, and there was a saying I heard the other day, which I think is quite um, quite important to just finish on the data side is, uh, so that if, if something isn't measured, it isn't managed properly. And I think that that's kind of speaks volumes for for how we should be going forward with that. So it's kind of using that 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 data to uh, help us moving forward. And the other aspect I, I wanted to touch on, which is is what we've learned uh, as, as well, is is obviously what what Dave touched on those digital technology, etc. Um, I agree with Dave. We were, we were well, the industry was looking into it a lot more. I do think we. Matt, someone might argue with me, but I think we were very behind the times in our industry with, with the movement of digital. Obviously, we've got the wearable technology in my zone, et cetera. But with a lot of it, I think we were, were dabbling in it, but I think we were quite asleep, is what I would say. And I think, obviously, when we hit these times, it was a shock and we had to quickly learn. Um, and I know myself personally, I can relate to that. Anything to do with technology and digital, I'd kind of pass it on to somebody else. Um, but this, I've had to embrace it myself and I've learned so much over the past 12 months and I've actually realised I enjoy it. <laughs> it's been really interesting, um, which has made me now step into something uh, in my future career, which which I'm going to touch on as well in a moment. But I'm definitely not an expert, um, but I'm definitely determined and excited for what um, my next um, plan is in my career with this. Um, I think we need to look at the digital technology side of it, that it's not just um, exercise, it's way, way bigger than that. And, and my plans going forward is involving that with, with, the, with the things that I'm going to do next. Um, we definitely can't go back to sleep. So even though our leisure facilities are now open, we can't park that side. We need to keep moving forward and evolving. Um, I was asked quite a few times in the lockdowns, do I think digital will take over? And my answer was always no. Um, but do I think it's it plays a part going forward? Definitely, absolutely, 100%. I do think it will do. Um, as for it not taking over, I think we've already it's already been proven in the reopening of our centres that we we haven't been able to do group exercise just yet, and it, that comes into play on Monday. Um, but the, these members are itching, they're chomping at the bit to get back into their classes, into their studios, and I always relate it to those people who are not really into group exercise or the social elements of exercise I, I if you've got your favorite um artist or band and you listen to them on your ipad or, or, or anything like that you enjoy the music and you, you get into it but seeing them live in in the real thing and, and in concert isn't it, it's just a different level the atmosphere and how much you enjoy it and the social animal and, and that's kind of how i see group exercise so that will always remain a part but outside our clubs, um, we need to be given another offering, 100% um, the digital, digital. So it's definitely more than classes. It's more than just online workouts. Uh, we've kind of nailed that area with fitness. Um, so, we, you know, we've got those members coming back in, those members who are motivated. Um, and, and, and as long as we keep the standards up and keep, you know, innovating with the trends of the industry and the offering, they will keep coming back, I do believe. But it's how we can tap into um, the people who I call always call the January joiners. So when they join in January and um, February, March, they've they've gone and they've given up whether they haven't got results, they've injured themselves because they've gone crazy or, or whatever. So it's them kind of people that I think we really need to tap into. And also those people who never try exercise and never tried it, never really been part of the life. And these are the, the that percentage of people who are probably in that obesity bracket. So I think we really need to key focus and we can make a massive difference in this in this area. I think we need to look at how we can break down their barriers. So whether that's time constraints, um, I think a lot of it is perception of fitness, which is why I kind of said it earlier on, instead of looking at his fitness, we need to look at his health. Um, I do believe that, that I get people coming to me all the time and I say, try this class or why don't you try this program? And they say, oh, gosh, no, I need to get fit before I do that. So it's kind of breaking those perceptions down that you have to be fit to join a gym or you have to be fit to do this. It's it's the journey of getting fit of how you get there. And I think it's 
them barriers that we need to really tap into. And I think we tap into them by, you know, focusing on people's mindsets, the motivation, the self-discipline. We need to look at changing behaviours and creating habits within these people. And that's where I think that's where my next step in my career is going to be. I'm, I'm going to focus on, on all these things going forward. So I'm deep diving into the creativity of, 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 of working on a tool. It's an app to facilitate a health and wellness journey that lasts a lifetime so where people don't give up um, it's natural to us in the fitness industry to, for fitness to be part of our lives but it's not for these guys so it's how we can lure them in and how we can keep them engaged um, and not giving up um, I, oh, I work with a lot of personal I mentor personal trainers and you know one of the problems that they always kind of come to me with is, is, is when they lose members or don't retain their clients is you know they come and they don't get results so the, the someone who's buying purchasing personal training will say well I'm, I do two sessions a week and I pay 50 60 quid but I'm not getting results but these people you know we've got to look at it as they're doing two hours a week with these personal trainers and there's 168 hours in a week so for those 166 hours what are they doing it can't just be these two hours that results are driven driven from so we need that information so the tool that I'm trying to create at the moment brings this information in and it analyzes people so we can create that personal journey and we can remote coach people as well as obviously physical coaching as well uh, and my aim is to help coaches and personal trainers in this uh, but also we need to make the client or the user or the member accountable to what they do um, so for example this is what we need to look into and what I'm really working hard on is it's not just the activity it's the the nutrition and the food it's the rest and recovery it's the mindset so if, if someone is not sleeping and they come to the personal training session that personal trainer needs to be alarmed that that person is at the low levels of, of energy if they've not eaten properly so we need somewhere where we can put this data and put this information they could be client can so that, that personal trainer can analyze it and really coach them and then from that you know the results will get that they need reward and recognition and I think that is definitely the way forward to impacting wider communities and and and, and bringing down the health stats of, of all the obesity and everything that we're facing at the moment so then the, the key things the good things that have come out of it and yeah, that's that's the way where well, I am personally working forward um, to try and help the sector that I love and work in. You told me you were going to go over time, Ruth. That's incredible. Thank you so much for that. Well done. Um, you just, you've just got a couple of minutes, actually. You, you did talk to me about really thinking about personalising the journey for your consumers. Just give us a little bit of insight on that. Yeah, I think that, I think it's really important that obviously if you if you've got a personal connection to something or if you feel because I think I said to you on the phone, David, sometimes I'll go on, on apps on my phone. It's like, hi, Ruth, you know, already it knows my name. It knows my information. And straight away I feel, oh, I've got a connection to that. How do they know that? But wow, it, it draws you in straight away. So I think it's knowing what our clients are doing is, is, is key important. And then we know how to tailor things. So it's not just they've done a Zumba class and we, we, we send Zumba things to them. It's, it's what have they done before that? What time did they come into the centre? So we know, you know, or for example, if they come and watch the child playing football, but they have a dip in the gym and, and things like that. So we, we really need to drill down to what our, our, what people are doing and then cater towards them and give them the remote coaching element through apps, et cetera, and digital stuff that, that will engage them and, and feel like it's related to them. Because we all know, I mean, if, if something's personalised, if you, if you walk in somewhere and someone knows your name, straight away you, you feel part of that. And, and that's about creating the communities, isn't it? It's bringing that community mm -hmm. aspect back in, which is which is massive to um, people feeling a sense of belonging. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ruth. So, um, Richard, I'm just giving you a heads up to get your microphone and your camera on. Um, we all have to say good morning to Richard because Richard is currently in Chicago. So it's currently five to nine in the morning. Um, uh, Richard, are you there? Excellent. Well, Richard, just to, as, a, as an introduction, Richard um, is a uh, fitness and wellness um, consultant um, and actually lived and taught and played rugby in the west of Scotland for a period of time. So he has some connectivity back to um, one of my favourite places in Scotland. So, Richard, you're going to talk to us about the road forward, the yearn to return. 
Yeah, interesting. Hey, um, Dawn, can, can we share my slides? If not, I'm just going to have to practice my presenting skills and talk through it. Get, get, uh, Richard, just give me a moment. If not, um, yeah, we've only got 15 minutes, right? So, and you guys are really tight on this. I'm really impressed. Um, and but thanks to to Dawn Ann and John Curley for inviting me along and connecting with Dave Dave Monkhouse. Um, and listening to um, to da obviously Dave Stalker, I had my my zone on this morning, and I'm I'm not dialing in from this yoga studio. That's just a background. I tried to put the Scottish Legend Network background on, but it was flipped back to front. And I thought, oh boy, I'm using Teams here, so I put the the background of a, of a yoga studio at Midtown Athletic Club. And Ruth, everything you said made sense. It was excellent. I thought that was great. And just make sure that Dave Wright is muted um, throughout this uh, throughout the next 15 minutes, please, so I don't get heckled. Don't get, don't get me, don't get oh, me. He's off. He's off. Someone use him. Take it away. Um, but, you know, oh, there you go. Look at that. So that means you're in control, Dawn. So feel free to come off mute or whatever you need to, Dawn, Dawn and, and join in. I've got 15 minutes, uh, and 15 minutes is not a long time, so I'm going to talk at a fast pace. Feel free to take notes down of whatever speaks to you, because I'm only going to really speak through – what my my experience experiences are. So I'm calling this the road forward, not the road back, and the yearn to return. Um, my name is Richard Ernie. You can change to the next slide, Dawn. Um, Just trying to, Richard. <laughs> okay, right. be with me. No worries. I mean, do you know what? I can talk without the slides if you want, and just talk to it. It's no problem. Just trying to get this to move forward. Right, here we go. Right, keep going. All right. We're up and running, you know, technology, right? So I could easily have called this the great interruption, which is what I call the last sort of 14, 15 months. I keep saying 12 months, but it's dragging on, right? I could have easily called this doing more with less, the year of disruption, or this is not easy, which I've heard a few times from you guys over the last sort of, you know, uh, 40 minutes here while I've been listening. Something that's come up that I, I just really want to lean into is that I love the Scottish Leisure Network Group purpose that says improve health and well-being of the nation. And their mission here is to create positive change in the health and well-being within their communities. I think that's something we can all get behind, right? I think it's pretty cool. Um, Dawn, next slide. So just a teeny little bit about myself. I don't want to drag on too long. I'm, I'm, I'm a Kiwi from New Zealand. Sorry about the accent, but I'm sure you guys get the same thing over there. Um, but you know, I've I've been doing this for 25 years uh, in executive operational roles uh, uh, in New Zealand, the UK, um, Europe, where I was working for the Spria Group, looking after clubs in Belgium, Italy, um, uh, Germany, based in Belgium, before moving to North America to look after Midtown Athletic Clubs, first in Canada and then the USA, where I'm based now in Chicago. So I'm going to talk through the experiences and things that I've noticed. Next slide. Um, there you go. I'm going to have to talk to this. I love Scotland. Um, I lived in the west of, of Scotland near Glasgow, Loch Lomond, Helensburgh area. Murrayfield is the best stadium in the world, hands down. I've been there many, many times. And I had to put this picture in here in the bottom right-hand corner because my first weekend there after a game of rugby, I was taken out for a pizza, which they just dropped in a deep fryer. Um, it sort of blew my mind, but it, apparently it's a thing, right? Um, I had to include that. Great experience, but love Scotland and close affinity to, to the country for sure. Next slide. Right, the great interruption. Um, and I call this COVID fatigue. And COVID fatigue is something we need to discuss and something we need to be aware of. Um, both Ruth has, uh, and David and David have spoken to this. And let's just fly through these slides, uh, Dawn. Next slide. There you go. Um, snacking. Oh, sorry. We'll go back one. Snacking. In fact, Dawn, you can take it off, and I can I can just talk through it. Okay. Okay. Might be easier. No. Yeah. Probably easier, right? Um. So snacking. We've seen an increase in snacking across the board. It's much easier to go to your fridge now um, and, and snack on junk food or whatever is in there than, than was ever before. You know, Grubhub and Uber Eats and, and delivery platforms like that have seen a massive increase. I read a report from Kellogg's the other day that their profits have shot up all from snacking-based foods, right? And I'm sure we can all it all resonates with us. Working from home 
You know, we've had to share houses and turn our spare bedrooms into offices and there's no separation from, from home and work now. It just makes it tough, let alone homeschooling. Homeschooling kids, trying to work from home, all the snacking, et cetera. It's sort of, it's not easy, right? It just, it all adds up. We've got a super computer in the palm of your hand, which I'm holding up here. Um, and I've been reading and, and looking into research on this, the amount of scrolling, endless scrolling, just looking at apps, screen time has gone through the roof in the last 14 months. I'm seeing some smiles from people's faces on here as they nod their heads and go, yep, I can, that I understand, right? Um, you know, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Apple TV, you know, their usage and subscriptions are through the roof. Binge watching TV, it just all adds up to inactivity, right? Um, people are staying up later. People are staying up later and people are waking up later. Why? Because they don't have to commute to work. I just have to commute from the bedroom to my spare bedroom or lounge to do work. So that's something to be aware of. When the world shut down in March last year, Good instructors and good coaches turned to virtual. Now, they didn't do it because they wanted to make a million dollars, right? Or a lot of money. They did it because they wanted to stay connected to their members and their community. However, a lot of them have been very, very successful and we're up against it. I'm going to talk about that soon. Companies like Les Mills, who had a product before, really boomed with their platform, Les Mills On Demand, and their in-club platforms and virtual streaming. And obviously, the 10-ton gorilla in the room is Peloton, a huge marketing tech company that happened to have a bike, right? Um, they've done a really good job. And just, just a, a heads up. What I'm noticing in the industry is that cycle boutiques are the slowest to come back and cycling in, in cycle studios are the slowest to come back because two things happened. When we closed in March last year, the cyclists, the avid cyclists, the riders, they either bought a bike, a Peloton, so they did this at home, or they stopped and took up something else. So we're, we're seeing that boutique is the slowest one to come back, which is pretty interesting. The next one is social anxiety, mental health. OK, and, and I think this is something that there's just not enough research on. And we're going to look into this for many years to come. I'm a passionate believer in uh, physical exercise and mental health. And Ruth, you touched on this. David, you touched on this. And this is very, very important, OK, uh, as adults and adolescents. And I think this is something that, you know, we need to lean into a lot more. OK, so what I'm getting at is this is not easy. But what we do as an industry matters, right? It makes a difference in people's lives. We're not selling Tupperware or Crocs here. Um, nothing against Tupperware. My mum used to sell Tupperware. But we're selling fitness and health and wellness, right? We are active social beings that crave human connection. We really do. Okay, and I think that's really important. It's good for us to remember what we do matters, so there's a saying in Māori in New Zealand, it is he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. And that translates simply as it is the people, the people, the people. And you guys are all club operators. You know, you guys uh, uh, manage and own and operate clubs. Well, not own, but operate clubs. And it's the power of your people, the mindset of your team that matters when bringing people back. We're a little bit ahead of you guys because we, we opened up before you guys over here in the US. Chicago was a little bit slower um, and they did think by the book it was pretty strict. So it's been good to, to go through this process, but it is the power of your people. OK, do not underestimate that all the way through from the reception, the housekeeping, the managers. They've all been through the same thing as we have. Right. But then we expect them to welcome back members and be upbeat and everything else. It's not easy. On top of this, the industry has hemorrhaged fitness professionals. Across the US and co conversations I'm having, having with uh, club companies in Asia, and uh, less so Australia because it was less affected in New Zealand, but particularly here in the US, they are really struggling to bring back personal trainers, not instructors, personal trainers. Every, every club I'm speaking to have lost the top 10 to 20%, okay? Because they're doing it from home. That, that will change. It will change because at some point members are going to go and people are going to say, hey, look, I like this, but I sort of want to get back. You know, I sort of want to get back. So just let it play it out. But as an industry, we need to start looking at how we hire, recruit and also compensate coaches. Right. Because many people have got out of our industry because they said, how can I create a lasting career in this industry? I'm talking about the fitness professionals here, not the leadership teams. I'm talking about the fitness professionals. You know, we've and this is across the board. 
it's sort of, you know, I, I get paid for what I do. So I think it's time that we need to start, you know, rethinking the model. We just see a club really do it, but I know some clubs are looking at it. And I think this is pretty cool. The concept of doing more with less. If you didn't look at your operational and st your operation strategy over the last 13 months, you missed out. We should have used that time, okay? So I've been with Midtown Athletic Club for a very long time, and we dug in. We really looked at our operational strategy. And what we saw is we can do more with less. Clubs and companies have got lean and effective, right? And I think this is a good chance to see what we're made of to make sure that we are being effective as we open up. Another thing to consider as you guys open up over there is obviously masks, social awkwardness. You know it. You go to the store and people are awkward, right? But we, we run clubs. Give yourself grace and ease and time, but give your team training, okay? Because when you've got a mask on, when you smile, your eyes light up, right? But then every other facial expression looks like you're upset and angry. So if you're thinking about something, you look upset. So you've got to train your reception team, your front of house team to use more body language, hands up, say people's names, welcome back. It's really important. Lean into the, 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 the mask discussion and do like social, um, social blogs or e-news recommending which masks to use, et cetera. And here's a tip for you guys. If you guys sweat, take three or four masks to, to the club when you're doing a class because you're going to end up waterboarding yourself. So take them up and put on a new one. Fact, right? Um, so, you anyway, know, just think about your team. Your team are super, super important. You know, health. Health matters. We're seeing two ends of the spectrum. Some people have just, just fallen right off the bandwagon and are inactive, eating more, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. On the other side, just by design, people are more health conscious now than ever before. Here's the thing. Uh, exercise and movement is prevention. And it's really, really important, okay? So I think this is something we all need to be aware of. Prepare for new members. What we are noticing as clubs come back, they are selling memberships. But here's the kicker. It's not just members returning. It's a lot of new members. And this is awesome. This is a lot of new members who wouldn't have come to our clubs before. Now, I've done some research into this and looking into this, it's, it's, it's really quite cool. If I wanted to take a yoga class before, a group exercise class before, I had to go to a boutique studio or a club, okay? A few, pe a few people had, were offering virtual programming at the time, but it really wasn't mainstream, you know? Over the last 12 months, that's all there really has been. A lot of people have taken up exercise and, and yoga and other styles of classes from the, the comfort and safety and security of their house with the, 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 the video screen off or video screen on, vice versa. This is something to think about. We're getting new members. I have had numerous conversations with these. I'm running a program called Build Better Habits at the moment. And I would say half of the people that are in this program are people that are new to exercise. And they've joined clubs. A lot of them have joined clubs because they've taken up exercise over the last 12 months through doing virtual-based programming. This is something I had not expected. Okay. So prepare for new members, members coming back. But in saying that, we need to ease our programming Okay, and, and our, our training and coaching and our offering for these people coming back to the club. People haven't lifted weights for a long time. People haven't, you know, maybe exercised intensely because you just don't exercise as intensely at home as you do in a collective group, right? Tell your instructors and coaches to dial it down a little, you know, ease into it. That's something that I've noticed as well. Also, build some programming to welcome these people back. All clubs should have a welcome back program to ease people into, into, uh, back into a fitness and a routine. Don't just open your doors. Be prepared for them and walk them through that member journey. Welcome them back. Um, there's a lot of chat. Ruth talked about this around in real life programming and virtual-based programming. I believe the future is hybridization, not this or that. It, it's going to be and. It's not, and. it's not and or. It's going to be and. Okay, so when members join clubs, they're going to tour the club and say, hey, fantastic, I'd love to join. Do you have a virtual offering as well? Okay, I think that's where we're going to go. Okay, um, what I'm seeing at the moment is uh, clubs as they're coming back, they're doing um, live in person classes, but they have a camera set up there as well. And for a small number of classes per day, their top instructors will 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 um, will um, you know screen their classes um, through through uh, Zoom or whatever platform as well. But look, watch this space. You know, um, I think that hybridization is important. 
Here's a tip for you guys. It's something that um, I was speaking to Dave Monkhouse about the other day, and it's something I recommend all clubs to do, particularly as you start to open up your doors again. It's called journey mapping. Journey map your experience through your facility, but do it through the lens of different personas or avatars. If you haven't created personas or avatars for your members, please do so. Okay, please do so. You know, your active aging community, your corporate middle ages, your Lululemon pant wearing Starbucks holding, um, you know, new mum. You know, these are generalizations, but it's important we do this. The athlete, the teenager, the, 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 the child, the adolescent, okay? The inactive adolescent. So uh, create personas. And here's the kicker. Be unapologetic on your programming. Okay, I often use this word being unapologetic um, because what health clubs and, and a lot of clubs do with their programming is they say, hey, look, we cater to everyone. We cater to everyone. You know, he's a 16 year old athlete or my grandma in a class. No, no problem. We cater to everyone. The issue with that is you're no one to anyone. You're nothing to anyone. So create programs that have a point of view and a perspective. So for the active agent, yeah, we've got programs for you. It's this. You make sure it's the right time of day, the right music, the right vernacular, the right equipment, the right programming, but be unapologetic and promote that to that person, okay? But on top of that, what you can then do is there's some really savvy things you can do on social and digital at the moment. Get out there and target market these personas. So you can target the persona of inactive wanting to come back to the club. You can target and promote I have taken up fitness or taken up activity during the last 13 months, but never been in a club before. Bake out your programs, be unapologetic with them. I think that's really, really important. And in the process of journey mapping, do this with your leadership team, pull in some key members um, from your clubs to do this. It's a great activity. Um, you meet up, you share ideas, um, but look where the journey starts. And it doesn't start from the moment you walk in the club, okay? It starts from the moment I pick up my phone and see what classes are on the next day or what, we, you know, or what time the crash opens or, or what's happening in the aquatics program, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so you map it out and you look for friction points. Look for friction points. So that's something that um, I think is a really powerful activity you can lean into. Look, my, on my last slide here, I had, a, had a, a quote and it says, life doesn't get easier or more forgiving. You know, we get stronger and more resilient and it's something that i passionately believe in so dawn that is it without the slide deck excellent job, love richard. it richard <laughs> great job thank well you done. very much <laughs> um so richard we've got a few questions actually that have come in for you we've got one from robert geddes and robert says could richard give an insight as to whether it's live virtual classes that's working or is it on the on-demand pre-recorded platform that's working? Both. Right. It's not, it's not one or the other, you know. It, there's something special about live, you know, because live, live virtual classes, because, you know, you commit to a time, you turn up, I'm there. When it's on demand, too many, ex, too many excuses come in, so you need a different level of intrinsic motivation, right? But do you know what I am seeing is, is these platforms are getting savvier. So I spent last year researching all these platforms, jumping on calls as we went worked with Midtown Athletic Clubs, so looking at who we wanted to work with, right? Um, and some of the platforms, and one called Forte, here's a plug for Forte, is one of the functions that they have, which I thought was pretty cool, is you can do an on-demand or live class, and I can get five of my buddies together, so we create like this private room. Mm -hmm. So we're doing it together with the class teacher. I thought that was pretty cool. So there's things that are going to come into play that, that are going to be good, but as, as Ruth was alluding to around, you know, habit formation, behavioral change, mental health and wellness, I foresee that this is a great platform to do at home workshops and programs around mental health, behavioral change, maybe uh, eating programs, you know, live better programs that you can do from, you know, um, from your facility and beam it out to your members from the comfort of their home because people are used to this now. Right. That's my take. Yeah, absolutely. Ruth, have you got anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I, I think I think same as what Richard said. You know, if people got an appointment, they've got a time slot, they, they're more likely to commit to that. So with with the online stuff, but I think when I think when the um, 
and Group X kicks back in, I think the live will slip a little bit because I think they like that connection with the the members, the other members, and you know they could see each other on the cameras. So I think going forward, this is just my opinion, um, that I think just the on demand would be more popular than the live things because I think the live people, members, clients will be back in our clubs and the live classes in, in, in person. Um, so that that's why I think. But I think great point there, Richard, as well of streaming. So you're kind of killing two birds with one stone. So if you've got a live class in club and you stream it's the cost element's not there as well and they've got that 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 personal experience from that that um instructor yeah i i agree with that ruth and ruth you said something you said you know you touched on this around coaching right uh, i believe in the art of coaching i don't like the word training we train an animal we coach the human being right but you know um you said that if I work with it, work with someone two hours a week, it's then what about the rest of their time? This is a way that clubs and coaches and instructors can stay connected with their members at home, right? Now, this is something, here's another plug for my zone, right? Dave and Dave, you'll like this. But my zone have been doing this for a very long time. You wear your, your heart rate monitor, you're connected to at home, or you can go out for a run. I've just been away for a week uh, in San Diego on a project in, and I got to wear my my zone every day, you know, so I stay connected. And so I think, you know, that connectedness back to your facility and back to your coach and back to your instructor, I think, is going to be important. Excellent. David, have you got any comments to add to this? It's really hard not to come in as a my zone person and be very my zone <laughs> here. But but the truth is that if you look at my zone remote and my zone remote plus, um, absolutely what Richard's talking about is is uh, is fully there. You know, the classes and uh, they're available and you can break it down so your friends are attending all your heart rates are appearing you could be all over the all over the all over the world and you can take that timetable drop in your own classes so my zone brought that in um, during this period really at such high speed to make it available I made it available to all its clients and everybody completely free of charge so you know um, yeah that's one thing I agree entirely with with what is being saying. Uh, I think that actually I'm less sure about the on demand. I think people like to say there's a class I booked. I can call uh, Richard and say I'm on the I'm doing the 7:30 cardio club. Are you doing it? And all the rest of it all over the world, and I can turn up there. And we know this from my zone. Even if you know the cardio club, most of those classes are getting 200 odd people in the morning from all over the country. Awesome. On them. Yeah, awesome. it, it's for me. It's it's supply and demand. It's economics. The two things in our businesses that ever had waiting lists were swimming lessons and good group exercise classes. <laughs> if we can offer group exercise both virtually and live at the same time, we can increase capacity of our busy spaces. Still haven't worked out how we can virtually learn to swim yet, but I'm sure we'll give it a go. Um, Richard, we we also have a comment about your your habits piece that you talked about there, and and the question from Jenny Brown is, what's the top professional team habit? post-COVID and top personal habit that you've created? Oh, wow. It's a great question. Um, here's a great book for you guys, Atomic Habits by James Clare. If you haven't read that one, put that on your reading list. It's a really, really good one. And he, he, he takes a lot of the work that was previously done by um, um, by James Fogg. I think it's James Fogg. Fog, anyway. Um, but one of the, the key things that I'm seeing around, around, it's not really about habit formation, it's around habit breaking because people have pulled up, they've created new habits over the last 13 months, some positive, some negative, right? So it's about creating new habits as, as we sort of, you know, come back and open up again. One of the key things that I, I like to do and I like to recommend to people is habit stacking. And habit stacking is simply this, take an existing habit and then put a new habit on top of it and obviously the existing habit needs to be a good habit <laughs> and not an existing habit absolutely thank you richard and, and one more for you um how will peloton's acquisition of pre-core affect the industry oh that's awesome um great question um, i'm i'm close with rob barker um who, who oversees he's um he's also from uh, the uk who oversees uh pre-core i think it's it's going to be an interesting move. I think we'll see connected fitness uh, go beyond just the, the bike and perhaps their treadmill, um, which they're having a few issues with at the moment. But I think this is going to be an interesting play. Their bike, Peloton bike, is not made for commercial use. So Midtown has three to four 
five of these Peloton bikes in every club, they are used from opening to close, right? And they're always breaking down because they're not made for commercial use. So I think that you'll see a more co a commercial bike come out for Peloton. Okay. Yeah, it's an interesting piece around the manufacturers and, and their linkage now with digital, isn't it? So, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm going to give our three speakers a bit of a heads up. And Ruth, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to give you two minutes to give us a closing comment based on what you've heard from the other speakers and based on what you're feeling currently and where you want to go. So I'm going to go Ruth first, then I'm coming to Richard, then I'm going to end with uh, Mr. Stalker at the end. So Ruth, you've got two minutes. Give us a closing remark, please. We didn't prepare. You didn't prepare us no. for this one. Did you? <laughs> um, <laughs> minutes as well. Uh, okay. So yeah, I, I my recommendations is is let's not go back to sleep. Let's let's stand together and move forward with with the digital side of it and and, and increase our value. And like Richard alluded to before, we do definitely look at that hybrid model. I think all our, all our customers are going to be expecting an in club and out of club experience. We want to create that branding out of out of our facilities. Um, and just, yeah, extra offerings. We're not just fitness products. We need to be, we're not just fit, fitness facilities. We need to be the coach. We need to mentally connect with them. We need to be adding all the added value. We're not just turn up for a gym and, and work out and go home. Um, and that connection through apps and remote coaching is definitely the way forward because we've only got so much time in our hands and we can't, we can't personalise everyone's journey individually, but we can with technology um, going forward. So I think we need to embrace this world um, very much so and, and, and obviously spin plates and keep what we've got in club and keep doing what we're brilliant at, but embrace everything else and move with it and not, not kind of just go back to sleep as I keep referring to. Excellent, Ruth. Pick that up very well. Thank you very much. So, Richard, you had a little bit more time to prepare. Yeah, no problem. Uh, well done, Ruth. <laughs> Put on the spot there. Um, look, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a confidence boost because um, just where we are in the US, there's vaccinations. Are, uh, have, you know, people are vaccinated. You know, it's great. Confidence is growing. You know, people are coming back. And I think that's really, really exciting. You know, DIY fitness, do it yourself fitness, which is go to the club and do it, jump on the treadmill, lift weights. That'll come back first. But people are craving that social connection. I saw a full class this morning, full based on, on restrictions but restrictions are easing, which is great here. So, you know, DIY fitness, people are, we are social beings. We crave human connection, right? We, we, we do. So the power of group programming and, and groupness and getting people back, that, that, that will increase and it'll increase quickly as people get vaccinated. It's just the way it is. Um, be prepared. Be prepared that a lot of your PTs won't come back. OK, so we need to be, be strategic with your team and start thinking about a game plan now. This is a good time to hire new coaches, by the way. Um, I am. Yeah, I think that that's it. Done. Also, hold on. One thing I think lean into the data. OK, the data will set you free, please. So, you know, you've got a lot of data. We've got so much data at our fingertips. And as a health club in the fitness industry, we, we just don't tend to use it. Right. Use the data. It tells a lot of stories. You say data, I say da data. <laughs> data, <laughs> data, yeah. No one time. understands me over here, Ruth, so tell you what. <laughs> Brilliant. And um, David, final remarks, please. Yeah, I think I, I, I would like to sort of twist that around and say, if I put my Europe Active hat on as president of that, what I would like the people who are listening to this to be doing, what the Scottish Network Group should be doing and all those people out there in order to get the message. So I think we need to continue to provide a platform for exchange of knowledge, which is what you guys are doing um, in professional yeah. standards, good business practice, business innovation, digitalization. We've got to discuss represent to be an advocate for the sector on political, political issues and all kinds of points. We've got to find, I suppose, common positions on issues of relevance and importance uh, and then publicize this. We mustn't be divided uh, on what we do. We have to be that strong voice for the fitness, exercise and physical activity sector. Um, support that sort of uncom uncompromising vision. It goes right to that more people, more active, more often. Let's really get stuck in there, promote the importance of active and healthy lifestyles. The people on this, this call, you're the leaders. So be the leaders for the sector based on your strong network and crucially cooperate with others, cooperate as a group so the industry are united through the, through those values and those principles um, and represent 
your area, whether that's regional, national, or a government government levels. Um, so going back to those four four key things of health, community, digital standards, the people on this call are the leaders who make that happen. Wrap it all up and and let let let's make it happen. And uh, between Richard and Ruth, they gave loads of ways through, and there's loads of ways you will be doing that. Um, but that would be my message. Thank you, David. I think there's been some excellent messages today. I think the use of data, the personalization piece, I really like Richard's view around using different personas for the experience journey because we are seeing from the data that we're getting back that different people have different confidence levels about returning and using that to, to really understand where we're going with what we know is so important. So I've thoroughly enjoyed today. I, I love days where I come away learning something new at the end of it. So thank you all very much. But before we close, I understand Susie from Simpspa wants uh, to uh, organise something very quickly. Susie, are you there? Yes, I am here. Thanks, David. Um, it was actually something that links in with communications from the Scottish Leisure Network Group, but I was just wondering, um, on the back of all of our fantastic speakers and, uh, and basically on the back of another very successful AGM, can I ask everyone to put their cameras on, please? And basically, plaster a great big smile across your face because what we'd like to do is take a screen grab um, and be able to share that on social media again to help with the profile of the group as well. <laughs> Dave Wright, I am loving that. Dave Wright. <laughs> <laughs> right, guys, if you go, we've got your cameras on. Awesome. Three, two, one. Brilliant. Thank you very much, folks. Excellent job. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Susie. Thank you to the Scottish Leisure Network Group. And, and I think Dave's call to action there is about all of us playing our part, but sharing what we learn and most importantly, sharing what doesn't work so others don't make the same mistakes. Um, Dawn Ann, thank you very much. Johnny, thank you for inviting me to, to host today. I hope it's worked. Guys and girls, take care. Thank you very much for your time. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye bye. bye.